Hello, my front end friends. I recently found this project right here over on front end mentor and I thought it'd be fun to build. So we're going to dive into it and create it today. We have a mobile view. We have this desktop -y view uh, with the hover state and a little bit more that's going to go on to here. We're going to do some cool CSS stuff, especially with the, um, there's an error state too that we can sort of tackle. And I'll talk more about that a little bit later. Uh, but yeah, well, we're, let's dive into it. We're going to build the whole thing from scratch. I've just basically downloaded the files from front end mentor. So if you do want to follow along, this is one of their free projects. The link for it is just in the description below. We don't start with too much here. You can see, uh, as I said, we have images for the different states. They do give us the assets. So we actually have the fonts that are here. So we can do some uh, font face stuff and not have to rely on Google fonts, which is uh, cool. Uh, and then we have the different images uh, like our icon success, which is an SVG. Actually, everything is an SVG that we're going to be looking at uh, right there and using those different assets. Uh, and when you first open up the index.html, there is some content that's already in here. I've just deleted everything that was in the body and we're gonna be bringing it in ourselves. So to get started with the HTML here, I like just having the image of what I'm building on the side when I write my HTML, because I'm just referencing what's here. Uh, so everything here, like if we look at it in the desktop view, it's sort of this contained thing, right? I don't know if this would be a component that we're placing somewhere on a page. Is this its own thing on its own page? We don't really have that context, but I do see that we need it sort of to be self-contained. So let's just do a newsletter uh, CTA and hit tab. I am using Emmet right now and Emmet is built into VS Code. If you're using a different code editor, you might have to install the Emmet extension uh, for it to work where I can just, you know, dot class name uh, and you can do more with Emmet than just that, but dot class name, hit tab uh, and it comes in with the div right there and we'll see a little bit more we can do with Emmet as we go through in this video. Now at the top here, we do have an image. The image is actually different between the two um, states here. You might be able to get away with one. I think the image is actually different enough though if we look at like the size of the iPad type thing that's there that we can't use the same one. So it's that's cool because that just gives us a good excuse to explore the picture element. And I'll talk more about the picture element uh, when we get to creating the desktop view of this. But for now, inside of my picture, I'm just going to do an image. And again, all I'm doing is writing IMG, hitting tab, and I'm getting this automatically from Emmet. And you can see uh, it's asking for my source. So in this case, if we look, it's just inside my assets, then inside my images. And that would, for now, we'll use the illustration sign up mobile. So I've got that in there. I'm just going to turn word wrap off for a second uh, and come down on this just to look because we do have the alt here. I'm not actually going to put anything. I'm leaving it blank because I really feel like this is decorative. It's not really helping add context to what we're looking at. There's no, you know, it's literally a decorative image uh, that's just at the top to make the page look a little bit cooler and a little bit more interesting. And in that case, you do want to include an alt attribute, but by leaving it blank, it means uh, screen readers and other assistive technologies will ignore it because it's basically indicating that it is decorative and they don't matter. So we can just leave it like that. We always want to use proper alt text, but in this case, I do believe leaving it blank is the proper um, solution. Next, we can come down. Uh, if this were part of another page, this would probably be at H2, I guess, right? Uh, just because, you know, we'd have a heading one somewhere else. But in this case, we don't actually have one. So I am going to make this an H1 just for a lack of anything else um, coming in here. And we could give this a class if you want. I'm not going to, and I'll talk more about that when I'm writing my CSS, but if you'd rather give this a class, by all means you can. And also I'm not going to bring the content right now. I'm just going to show the structure I'll be using and then I'll copy paste the content in quickly just so you don't have to sit through me you know, watching me do that side of things. Now next up we have this join 60,000 plus people, which to me is just a paragraph. So we can drop the paragraph there. Uh, then we have this list that's coming here. I guess this one we'd probably want a class on it just because it is kind of a fancy list. Um, so I'm going to call it, I'm going to do a UL dot check mark list just cause you know, you might have other lists on your page that are different from this one. I wouldn't do it as like an, if you're using BAM or something, you might see some people come in here and do like a newsletter CTA list. If this was unique to the newsletter and you'd never have this anywhere else on your project, maybe these are little, instead of check marks, it was little envelope icons or something. I guess that would actually make sense. But I see this as being something that potentially could be used elsewhere. And as soon as you do newsletter CTA list, that can only be used within the newsletter. I'm a fan of BEM. I used BEM for a long time, 
but people sort of get over reliant on the blocky formula of it. If you don't know what BIM is, don't worry too much because I'm not using it in this video. Um, so I'm gonna do my, uh, what did I call it? Check mark list, right? Check mark list. And before I hit tab on this, I'm gonna come in here with the greater than symbol. I'm gonna say li times three or star three, I should say. And you can even see that VS Code is showing me what this is going to create um, over here, right? So it's an Emmet abbreviation. When I hit tab, it's gonna give me that full structure, which comes in just like that. Perfect. Um, that's great. Next, we wanna come down to this bottom part and that bottom part is the actual form <laughs> that we're gonna have here. I'm not going to make the form work. Uh, there is a second page if you do this challenge, that could be something that you work on you know, once they submit what happens next. I'm not gonna do that as this one because it's a bit out of scope of what I wanna cover uh, for this video where I wanna focus more on some fun CSS stuff um, for the styling because that's what I do on my channel, <laughs> right? Um, there's so many great form videos out there on YouTube. We don't need another one of those. So uh, form, we have that right there. I'm gonna do a dot form group right here. Uh, we will have to return back to this in a little bit because if we actually, uh, there's an error state where there's a little bit of extra text, but let's keep it simple for now and we'll add that in once we worry about how we're gonna handle the error states. And I, I do form groups all the time in my forms. It just helps me sort of well, group things together. And the reason for that, if we look at the, the layout here on the spacing, we sort of have more or less consistent spacing between a lot of these elements, but then the space here is really small. And I'm gonna be using grid, I think, just to set up my spacing. It's the easy way when you have consistent spacing. And I don't want this to be this extra large space that also comes in. So this just helps me say these two things belong together and I can adjust their spacing independently from everything else. Uh, and for that, we're gonna have a label plus an input. And if we use plus when we're using Emmet, it's just going to put the two of them in there together. So we get my label there and my input. This will be an input type of email, which will lead to some form validation. You don't wanna rely on this. We'll talk more about that when we get to the error state, but this can be useful for some things before the user actually submits, um, you know, to make sure some elements, at least of their email are there. Uh, so for the four here, I am gonna write email. And because this label is for something, we do have to identify it with an ID so we can write email right there. And the last thing, I wanna keep this inside my form. We can add in the button. And I am gonna give this a class is equal to button. This could also be an input type submit, but if you have a button inside a form, it's going to treat it like an input type submit anyway. So we can leave it just like this. If you'd rather use the input type submit, that would be perfectly fine as well. And that's the structure of it. So I'm just gonna edit out where I copy and paste all the text in here, and then I'll see you on the other side when we start writing some CSS. All right, so I've brought in all the content, uh, so you can see what I currently have so far on the screen there. Here we still have the design. Uh, and I have this that I just left on the screen for now is the placeholder. And so where we can see the email at company.com, we do wanna make sure we bring that in as the placeholder right there. And it's really important that if you're using placeholders, they don't replace labels. You can see here we have the email address and then we have an example here. Sometimes you'll see where it says email address in the placeholder area. That's really what a label is for. So just make sure we have our label here and then we have the placeholder because the placeholder disappears as soon as we start writing text. It's really meant to be an example to show people what they can be writing in that field where we have the label saying what that information should be. Yeah, now we can dive into actually getting some CSS in here. So let's come and in my folder, I'm going to make a new file called style.css. And then I'm going to go back to my HTML file for a second. We'll come all the way up to the top. And I'm just going to come here and say link. And I can even choose link uh, colon CSS right there. And it's just going to set the uh, rel style sheet and the href to style.css for me. This is, again, Emmett doing this. It's always gonna call it style.css. So if you called your CSS file main or app.css or whatever, um, or styles.css, you will have to update the name. It's not smart. I just named it that knowing that Emmett would call it um, style here. So I'm gonna hit save on that. And a good thing to always do at the beginning, just to make sure you've done things properly, is give your site a background color. So let's just do a background of uh, purple for now. We can see it's working, <laughs> so perfect. Because the amount of times I've written some CSS and then I thought it was a, a typo in what I was writing and it wasn't working, but it's because I either forgot my link or something else along the way, um, very silly. So just always test to make sure your CSS file is working. Or sometimes you just forget to even save your HTML file, right? So uh, there's lots of silly mistakes we can make. And we don't want to make that one where we were doing everything properly and we just missed, we had a typo in our file name in this side or something like that. Awesome. 
now I'm gonna come in, we're gonna do a few parts a little bit quickly here at the beginning, and then we're gonna get into writing more, like I'll be writing most of the code here line by line. Uh, but I'm coming in with a little bit of a reset here where we have our box sizing border box, which just makes sizing things a little bit easier if we assign a width to it with padding. Uh, my image with a max width of 100% display block, just make sure that my image is responsive. We're removing margins from a lot of things. You might have something like a star margin zero. If that's the case, that's perfectly fine, but I'm just being a little bit more specific with what I'm targeting here. And even you can make this as specific as you need for any project. Like in this case, I could probably do that and be completely fine uh, just because we don't have a lot of elements, but it doesn't hurt having it. It's not gonna make the selector any slower. And then down here I have, and I'll talk more about this once we get to styling the actual list here, uh, but I'm doing a list style of none if I have a role of list or for a UL or an OL. And I'm also gonna add in here a margin of zero and a padding of zero. Uh, on that as well, just because I wanna get rid of any extra spacing that's on there. I haven't added this yet. Again, once we get to actually um, styling this up, I'll talk a little bit more about that. And I'm gonna copy and paste one more thing before we start going more line by line. It's gonna be all the way at the very top here, and I'm just gonna set up my custom properties. Uh, most of these are coming from their style guide because uh, Front End Mentor does give these simplified style guides. They give you the colors that are being used. Uh, the font size for the paragraphs here, the font family that's being used, uh, and a few other things. And this is what you get if you have a free membership. If you pay, you can get a Figma file. It's a little bit easier to work with. Uh, in this case, we're gonna have to eyeball a few things because we're just gonna be working from the JPEG, but that's fine. I think it's, you know, we can see that we can get really close without uh, requiring the Figma file. Though if you're working on some of their bigger projects and they do have projects that are only available on their paid tiers, they have the you know, fancier style guides within the Figma and other stuff too that are really good. But for today, we're just gonna base it on this style guide here. Uh, and the way I name my custom properties is I have my name of my color. So CLR means color, then the name of the color, and then just the shade of it uh, or the tint of it or however you wanna look at it. So 100 is always my lightest, all the way up to 900 is usually my darkest. You might say there's like arbitrary <laughs> skipping here, but just like dark 700, 800, 900 type of thing, lights 100, 200, uh, and so forth. Uh, this color was the orange one that's used in the design and not in their style guide was this color that is right here And so I'm just gonna move over so you can see it and that's actually coming on the buttons when we hover on them There's a gradient on the button and we'll be using uh, And I just used a color picker to to get that color, but it's just this right here uh, My font family base is just you know my font family that I'm going to be using which was just Roboto uh, It could be default. It could just be font family, whatever you want uh, I guess it doesn't even need to be a custom property because we only have that one font But I like having it there anyway my font uh, weights and then my font sizes right here And again here the numbering system I use is the same 400 is sort of my body's font size And then the larger the font size I go larger in the number uh, in this case, this is the only other font size, I think. Ooh, I think we actually have a small one there that I didn't see. So we'll add that in, font size 300, and that looks like maybe like an eight uh, point. I'm gonna try that. Again, we're eyeballing. I don't know about this 2.5 either. Uh, we're gonna see, and then if we need to adjust, we can adjust along the way. Sometimes you miss stuff along the way when you're creating this as well. There's no harm in going back in after and adding other things, but I think this is everything we're going to need. And if you've never used custom properties, don't worry, this might look really weird. We're just basically taking all the different stuff that we're gonna use, shoving it in here. I have an in-depth playlist on custom properties that I'll add a link to in the description. Uh, but I think you'll be able to follow along with how they're working. It's not very complicated. We're just gonna reference back to these a whole bunch of times. So we're gonna hit save there and we're gonna start going. Uh, the other thing that I do wanna mention is I am using one extension within VS Code called Live Server. If you're using another editor, they all have some version of this. Some of them even have it built in. Um, so I'll put a link to that in the description as well. It just, I click the little um, go live here at the bottom and that opens it up in the browser for me. And then if I make any changes, they're, they're gonna happen here automatically. So let's just say that, I don't know, uh, we have a font size of three rem or something. Then we can see without me having to do anything, the font sizes adjust, I get rid of it and they go back down. Uh, so that can be handy when you're working. Every time you save, the update happens right away. Now we wanna dive in and start getting things to look good, but we do have the font that we need to bring in first. Uh, and for that, we're gonna be using an at font face since we do have the fonts uh, already in here, right there. And in general, it's better to use locally hosted fonts instead of Google fonts. Google fonts used to have the advantage of cross browser caching. So if one person, you know, if 
somebody had visited a different site with Roboto and then they visited your site, they already had it on their computer, but it's been years now that cross-site caching doesn't work. Um, so it's probably going to be better performance, uh, especially if you have a CDN or something else set up. If you don't know what any of this means, don't worry. But yeah, it generally will probably be better if you self-host your fonts. So to do that, let's come all the way and the font face rules are an at rule. So they'll usually be at the top here. And we knew an font face. Uh, and you can see um, I have a bit of the autocomplete coming in for this, but we have our font family here. So that's going to be the name of it. So in this case, I'm going to call this Roboto. And we have two different ones that are coming in, but uh, it's important that the name here, like Roboto is the font family. So the font family can have lots of different weights to it. Um, so we're going to have different versions of Roboto coming in. That's fine. Uh, then we have the source and we have the URL. So this would be like the path to get to where we want. So in this case, my assets, my fonts, and then I can, we'll start with the regular one. Uh, and then we can also do the font weight here is going to be my 400. Uh, you could also write regular, uh, regular if you wanted to, cause it's the regular, but I'm just going to put 400 here. There is one more thing that we could actually do here with the source, uh, is we could say, and I'm just putting this on another line where I'm going to write local. And we could say this could be a uh, Roboto regular, and that should have been in quotation marks. And here I'm just going to put a comma. So what this would do is it's going to look to see if it can find Roboto regular on the person's computer before it's going to try and download this from the server. So if they have Roboto installed, it just means it's, you know, they don't actually have to download an extra file, which is a good thing. Uh, and then we can just copy this entire font face declaration, paste it here. And then in this case, we're going to call this one Roboto Bold. We can look for our Roboto Bold right here. And this will be our 700. And now we have both fonts that are ready to go. Now, one thing I'm doing here is we only have the TTF version, but sometimes you'll have other versions of your fonts as well, because you might have the TTF and you might have like a WOFF and other stuff like that. You might want to bring multiple versions of it in. Uh, and there's a little bit more we can do with the font face than what I'm covering right now. So if you'd like a more in-depth video, I'll put a card actually should be popping up and I'll put a link in the description to an in-depth video that I've done on font face. But one way you can double check to make sure it's working, because I actually have Roboto installed on my computer. And because of that, if I didn't have the font face declarations here, uh, it would still work because uh, the browser is smart. And then it was, oh, I found Roboto on the computer. Uh, so one way you can test to make sure it's working is let's call this uh, Roboto test. And then I'll come here and I'll put Roboto test here. So we've called this font family Roboto test instead of just Roboto. And that means down here, let's just come on my body. We'll come all the way down. We'll say body. If I say the font family now is let's try just R for fun. Uh, you can see it doesn't work, right? We're, we're just getting the default right now. But if I come in and actually do Roboto test and hit save, look at that. It's working. We're getting Roboto coming in because it's going and it's grabbing this Roboto test here. And on top of that, we can choose the different font weights, right? So we have a font weight of 700 and it will become bold or we have the font weight of 400 and that's going to work because it knows where to get these files from. It'd be a little bit weird to call it Roboto test though, so I'm not going to call it that. Uh, and in fact, we set up our variable here of our base with our font stack right there. So for these, let's bring them back to Roboto. But just in case, uh, this is a nice way just to make sure you come up with a different name for it. So you can make sure that it's actually going through and finding the right files and, and it's all working properly just in case you do have the font installed. Um, it's just giving it its own unique name can be a good way to go. Awesome. Now we can actually start making this come together. So we had the font family. Let's bring that back in. Uh, and one reason I like using um, the variables the way I do it is the hyphen hyphen here in VS Code, it's going to give me a list of all of my custom properties. And then if I do an FF, it's going to show me all of the different font families I have. And it even tells me this is Roboto uh, right there. So that's kind of cool. Hit save. We get that. Uh, the font size is in this case FS. So I need my 400, my font weight. And you might say, well, you don't really need the font weight. I do actually like um, declaring it as a just in case. Uh, that's font size. I want font weight, uh, regular, just in case. You never know. Uh, it could even be that you're regular. One of the reasons I do call it regular is because some times your, your base weight will actually be a 300 instead of a 400. So I just like um, always declaring these things in case there's a difference or a change that's made at this level. 
And really quickly, if you haven't used custom properties now, hopefully it's kind of clear what's happening. I'm saying font family is my base. It's finding the base from the root that I declared up above, my font size, my font weight. We're just referencing those values that are sort of saved up above. Then the advantage is if I use it six different places, I can update it in one place and it's gonna update all of those other places at the same time. And I don't have to go hunting for where I've applied those different values throughout my file. Awesome, now our color is definitely not black, so we do have uh, our CLR, and in this case, it would be probably, I'm guessing, the neutral 800. You know what? I think it's actually the 700. The difference is really small. Um, it could go either way. I could I color pick it and find out. Well, maybe not. I don't know. It's one of those two. We'll go with the 800. Um, I think that makes a bit more sense. And if I look here, the line height looks a little bit tight, I think. Um, so actually, in this, uh, let's just right click in here and do inspect. There's other ways of opening up your dev tools. Uh, but we're just gonna, we can actually turn that off for now. I just wanna squish it down so it matches our design a little bit more um, on the line breaks and everything else. <laughs> and so if we look here, the see how the, it just looks a little bit tight um, in my opinion. So I'm also gonna come in here and do a line height of probably a, of probably I think 1.6 is usually my default starting point. Maybe this one's a 1.5. Yeah, that looks pretty good. Uh, the next one, let's come in and actually let's go look at our structure really quickly here. Because uh, we had set up the picture at the top and then we just had all of our content here. But notice how my content is touching the edge of the page uh, down on this side and here we need some spacing on it. We need to add a bit of spacing on the top. We wanna make sure it doesn't touch the bottom too if we're on like a smaller viewport and everything, right? So there's different ways that we could do this. But for me, the easiest way to do it is actually to grab everything that's not in the picture because the picture needs to actually touch the edges here. So I'm gonna come here and I'm gonna come all the way down to here. I'm just gonna select everything and I'm gonna do a control shift P. And when I do that, it opens up the command palette in VS Code and I'm gonna write Emmet wrap. And you can see it says Emmet wrap with abbreviation. So I can just hit return to select that. And I want this to be a div. And this div is just gonna be, I think we're just gonna do a dot .content to give it a class of content. And then I'm gonna push enter to confirm that I want that. And you can see it's brought that in. Uh, if you were using BEM right now, you could do a newsletter content. This would actually be, unlike with the list where I don't think it was the right place to use BEM or to treat this as the block for that list necessarily. In this case, I would actually treat it that way, but we're just gonna call it content. So it's my, the content inside of my newsletter CTA and just is gonna help us group everything. So we can come back to here and let's just make a selector of newsletter CTA. That's going to be the start. We're gonna do some stuff in here, but then let's come down onto the next line and do the newsletter CTA uh, and then I'm gonna do a space dot content. And we can even be more specific and say that if the content is a direct child. You might have read some tutorials or watched some content that says you shouldn't use descendant selectors. Um, I'm, I don't believe in that. <laughs> and you'll also hear people complaining with the lack of scope in CSS. This is scoping my content selector to here. You do wanna be careful because of the raised specificity of it, but if you're doing one level deep and you're being very specific on what you're working on, I think it's perfectly safe to do this type of thing. Uh, but again, if you want to avoid it, you can do the BEM style selector where it's a single class, then you can't run into specificity issues or you shouldn't run into any specificity issues. But I'm gonna do this instead. And I'm just gonna say padding, we'll go with one rem maybe, Ooh, maybe a bit more, two rem. Um, I'm just looking at the space that we have that's coming uh, like right here and my, my final one is going to be a 1.5 for now just to give me the space that I want around there. We could also take this same pattern and we're going to come here and that's our content uh, or actually let's bring this here and I'm going to come here and we're going to say that if we have the H1 is inside of our newsletter CTA this is where maybe a class you know what we'll do the class instead of the H1. Uh, and I'll, I'll explain why I'm changing my mind on this. So let's come here and say class is equal to title. Uh, and the reason is, let's just style this. So it was font size. We had our font size 900. Let's see if that looks like it matches up. It's not too bad. I, th I don't know if I'm at 100% zoom here. This actually will show you at the bottom. So let's zoom in. Oh no, I'm not getting accurate zoom levels. So it, let's just, it looks pretty close, I think. Uh, so I'm going to stay with that. Yeah, I'm pretty happy with how that looks actually. Um, but yeah, the reason I'm switching this to title is because remember I said this is my H1, but if you're putting this into a different context, it might be an H2 or maybe it's even an H3. I think it'll probably usually be an H2. Uh, 
in, in most circumstances. So it lets you change the element here where you're still getting the same styling that's gonna get applied to it. And because that element could change, just to be safe, we can also come in with our font weight of our uh, FF bold and hit save on that one as well. So that looks pretty good uh, and I'm mostly happy with that. The next thing I'm gonna do here is on the content as well. Remember I mentioned the spacing between everything was kind of consistent along the way. And so to be able to get that, I'm gonna come on the content here because remember the content, this is my content and then we have all of the content inside of there. <laughs> so on that content, I'm gonna come in with a display of grid. And the reason I wanna do grid on there is so I can use my gap. And we're gonna do, I don't know, let's try a 1.5 rem so it's the same as the padding. That's way too big, so we'll do a one. Uh, and that looks pretty good. I'm not looking at this space because we have some extra margin on there right now, but this space looks close enough to me. Again, we're just eyeballing it. So um, my eyeballing there, it's looking pretty good and I'm happy with that. Uh, you might see other examples of people using flex for this type of thing. Grid's just easier because you don't have to change the flex direction. <laughs> uh, so display grid, gap, and you're good to go. Whereas if you use flex, you change the flex direction. And I'm just using it for the consistent spacing. Uh, and then there's our list here. And our list is kind of interesting because we need to change those over. And we had the check mark list here. And then we had that role that I'd mentioned of list. And the reason there, you can see this has changed this. And we've changed our spacing. We've taken off the bullet points because let's go get a reminder. When we do the role of list, our list style is gonna be none. And we're also removing the margins and the padding. The reason I'm doing this is because when we do a list style of none, voiceover on Safari, which is a screen reader, will actually stop announcing that element as a list in some situations. Uh, if it's a navigation, it won't. It is still keep it as a list as long as it's within a nav element. I believe that's the latest update anyway. But uh, if it's just a list that's floating around somewhere, it won't announce it as a list. And in this case, it definitely is a list. I'm, I just wanna be able to change my bullet points. Uh, there are ways that we could change this while keeping it a list with the marker, but the marker is really hard to position. So if you're thinking of that, you can definitely try it out. But I'm gonna use some pseudo elements instead to bring them in just because it gives us a little bit more control on both the positioning of these and the spacing we're gonna get. And by doing it this way, we're keeping the semantics of the list, but we're getting to style it however we want. So let's come down and we're actually gonna set that up next. We can come here and we can say that was our fancy, uh, that was our check mark list, I believe, right? Uh, I think that's what it was called. This is say color is red. So we can see that's the right name. Again, if you're not sure <laughs> about your something or something's not working, just color stuff to make sure that your selector is the correct selector. Uh, and on this check mark list, for now, I don't actually want to style this. What I want to style is my list items. And I want to style the list item four. And if you haven't used a pseudo element before, this is a before pseudo element. We'll see how this is working in a second. Uh, but for pseudo elements to work, we do need to give them the content property and, or they just won't generate and won't show up on the page. So we have to say content. If I, let's just put content here, A, and you can see the letter A is showing up before each one of them. So whatever you put here, it's adding that content before, in this case, before the element. And if I said after here, it's gonna do the same thing, but it's gonna add it after the element. Now, a lot of the time you're actually going to leave this blank and you're gonna bring in some sort of decorative element or something else. But one thing people don't always realize is you can actually use the URL here and bring in resources like images. And we have an image in this case, right? In our uh, assets, we have in our images, the icon list.svg and I hit save and look at that, it brought it in. But there's a bit of a problem. <laughs> First of all, let's make this a before instead of my after. Um, so it's brought it in, which is great, but the layout is very broken. And to fix this, what I wanna do is in the dev tools, I'm gonna to break my dev tools off just so we can look at them in a bit more detail. Uh, so they're a bit bigger and it makes it a bit easier to see what's happening in here. So in my document, let's just, uh, we're gonna grab this little guy here and then I'm gonna click on the element. So then it's selecting the element within my dev tools. And you can see that here's my LI. And if I look in my LI, I have two things now. I have the before pseudo element and then I have the content itself. And this is important because we basically have two different pieces we can work with, with with this one LI. So because of that, we can actually, let's copy this, say that this is a display grid. Hit save and it's gonna do that. 
But now we can say that we have grid template columns. And let's just say this is gonna be one rem and then an auto. And so it's made the first column one rem and then we have the rest of it. And so in this case, there's different ways we could work around what the size of this one is. And it's gonna sort of work with our pseudo element, I believe. Uh, but what I wanna do in this case is maybe make that a two rem or a 2.5 rem. And then I can just sort of choose the space I want left to right and it's gonna take up that much room and then everything else is just gonna line up and it's pretty good, <laughs> right? And then the last thing I need is I do need a little bit more space between these. So we can just come now on our actual check mark list that we haven't done anything with yet. And I'm gonna do a display of grid and add a gap of 0.5 rem maybe, um, just to add a little bit more spacing between them. You could add margin bottom to your list items, but the problem is then the last list item is also getting that margin bottom, which you may not want. Whereas if a gap is only going to be between the elements, which is kind of handy and a little bit uh, easier to work with. And there's ways of doing like, you know, if you did use the margin, you could choose all your list items except for the last one uh, and then add your margins and stuff. But it's just, if you're doing that, you might as well just choose the parent and add a gap that way. I just find it a lot easier. And I'm going to dock my dev tools back onto the side just to squish everything down a little bit. Um, just so we can see, you know, with this text actually wrapping, you can see it's actually matching up pretty good to there. My gap might actually be able to be a little bit bigger um, and match the design a little bit more. We can play around with it uh, and, and try and get the right number, but I think that actually looks pretty good right now. Next, we can turn our attention over to this area, right? Uh, and right now, actually, I just wanna say my CSS isn't terribly well organized right now, but it's such a small project, I'm not gonna stress about that side of things too much. The only thing I'm worrying about is like all my checkmark stuff to, is together, all my newsletter stuff is together, uh, and now I'm gonna come down and do some of my form stuff. Just keeping everything organized that way, I think on something smaller like this is fine. If you get into larger projects, you might want to spend a little bit more time just thinking about how you're actually organizing uh, the CSS. And you can use big comments and other stuff too to just help sort of, here's my layout classes and here's my component classes and here's my reset classes and here's utility classes and everything and just sort of section off uh, the different parts of your file. But for smaller things like this, we won't worry about it too much. And actually with that, in mind, I think what I'm gonna do is actually take this check mark list stuff and I'm just gonna move it up to here. Uh, and the reason I'm doing that is because like body is a very generic selector. The check mark list, again, it's living inside of here, but in my mind, this is part of a bigger project and this would be reused in other places. Uh, and then I get to these sort of more specific componenty things afterward. Uh, and the reason I'm doing that is because now that we're gonna move off to this form, I think we're gonna start is the inputs just with a general input selector like this, just because I have a feeling this is what they would all look like, right? Uh, they're, uh, generally speaking, we end up with pretty generic inputs that look the same across entire projects. Uh, and we'd also have the dot form group uh, as well, which we'd be reusing basically anywhere that you have a form. So the first thing for my form group that has my label and my input in it, uh, I think what we're going to do is actually say the font size on here. And I'll talk more about that after, but font size, that's my small font size. So it's gonna make everything a little bit smaller, but that's okay. Uh, we'll also say this is my font weight is going to be the font weight of bold. And there we go, at least the label looks a little bit better. And yeah, there we go, uh, look, that looks okay. Obviously the input needs to be fixed, uh, but with the form group, the other thing I do like to do, you might have, be seeing a pattern at this point, is a display of grid. And then in this case, I think the gap would be like a 0.5 or something like that. Uh, 0.5, you gotta give that a unit, rem. Uh, just, ooh, it's even, oh uh, yeah, maybe that's okay actually. It's giving me that small space there. Uh, the entire form is also gonna get a grid on it just so I can get this gap here. But I might come back to that a little bit after. Um, yeah, let's let's come here and just style the input for now and then we'll, we'll get the button styled up. So it looks like there's a fair amount of padding on here. So we'll start with one rem. Uh, border radius looks pretty big, 0.5 rem maybe. You'll notice I'm using rem instead of pixels. For things like padding and border radius, you could be using pixels. Uh, the one place I wouldn't is font sizes, um, but that doesn't look too bad. And it, just in general, a lot of things are base 16 in design anyway. So if like one rem, no, 1.5, maybe that's it. Border radiuses are often like four, eight, 12 and 16, so that's a 0 0.25, 0 0.5, 0 0.75, or one uh, rem. So it, you'll you see like common patterns coming up with all of these things. I'm gonna do a font of inherit actually, 
Um, just because if you don't inherit the font, it won't it won't bring in the font family. Maybe we're just gonna uh, yeah, I'm gonna do a font of inherit and then overwrite the the things like the font size just to bring them back up to that to the 400 and then the font weight. I guess mm, I'm I'm debating uh font weight of regular. I'm debating whether <laughs> is it better just to inherit the font family and then you might not have to do this. Um, but whatever, pick your poison on that one. <laughs> uh, but that looks pretty good that we can come in. I'm pretty happy with that. Uh, there is, if we come back to the designs here, we do have the uh, error states. Let's go look at the, uh, no, I don't wanna look at the error states yet. I wanted the active states. Uh, just because this shows us, so when it's active, you can see that we have a darker border coming around the whole entire thing. Whereas if we go just to the regular design, it's a really light border. And right now we always have the darker border. And I think we can rely on having the uh, input come in. So uh, the input, the focus ring come in when we're inside of it. So let's come in with the border here of one pixel solid. And then we do have some colors here we haven't used. Maybe it's the neutral 200, which it didn't do it properly for me there. Uh, color 200. Let's try that. Uh, 100 is the white color, so I think 200 is probably the right one. It looks a little bit darker, to be honest, but I'll stick with that as my color. And you know what? The placeholder also looks kind of light. So let's come in and fix that placeholder. Placeholder. And you can style it like this. So if I said color is red, uh, my, my placeholder is red. But in this case, I think we want the same um, that we had here. And yeah, there we go. That looks not too bad. The font weight in their design looks bolder than mine, but I'm using the right one. So um, sometimes between design software and the browsers, there's differences in the way the fonts are rendered. There can be differences between browsers and how fonts are rendered. There can be differences between operating systems on how fonts are rendered in terms of how thick or thin they are. Uh, so just keep that in mind. There are some font properties that you can use to get things to be a bit more consistent there, but it's a little bit out of scope of what I want to talk about in this video. Uh, so that looks okay. When we go in, oh, there we go. You can see the default focus ring is actually perfect in darkening up the outside the way we want it to be. So I'm pretty happy with that. I guess we can move on to our button. So we'll just come here and do our button. Input, I'm gonna move the button actually to after the form group just because my input and then my form group, they're sort of related. My button sort of is too, but buttons can be used in all sorts of different places. I'm only giving it a class of button. I would assume in a bigger project, there's other types of buttons and everything, accent buttons and primary buttons, secondary buttons, but we only have one, so I don't know. So we'll just do our, our button here. This is a background of my neutral 800 and the color will be my, um, Neutral 100, the font weight is going to be the font weight of bold. And that's okay, border zero, because I use the actual button. Padding is probably close to what we had. Border radius will also be, I think I did a 0.5, right? So it's gonna be about the same. They're definitely the same border radius. Uh, and now you might notice, ooh, <laughs> font weight is there. Let's do a font inherit as well. Uh, so it's the right font family and font size. Because <laughs> once again, uh, buttons and inputs and selects and other stuff like that are the only properties that don't inherit your font properties by default. So by doing a font inherit, it's going to bring in all the font stuff you want. And I actually think that's pretty close to what we need. The one difference is theirs goes all the way across, <laughs> whereas mine's not going all the way across right now. And of course, we have that space. So that does mean we need to add a grid on this. And for that, I am going to do this as part of my newsletter CTA and then choose my form just because most forms are going to have different layouts and different styling. So I do want this one to be specific. So if you were doing BEM, you'd have this as a class of newsletter CTA form. That would be perfectly fine if you need to give that a class. I'm once again, not gonna worry too much about having descendant selectors, but I am gonna keep them everywhere. I have my newsletter CTA here. So we can do that newsletter CTA form and say it's a display of grid. And just because it's a grid, it's gonna stretch right away. And then we can do a gap of 1.5 rem. And there we go, that looks pretty good. 
I'm happy with that. <laughs> um, we do need a hover state on the button. And I just realized something that's kind of annoying. Uh, <laughs> on my list, uh, they have more space here than I have here. And I'd mentioned on the list, not, you know, we have our check mark list and I used the gap because I didn't want extra space on the bottom by putting a margin bottom on this. But now I need more space there. I am going to say that I would still take this approach because once again, this check mark list can now be reused anywhere. And I just think it's better practice to do that. And then if you need extra spacing somewhere, you can add it in specific places. So you might have a utility class that would let you do it. In this case, I'm just going to say that my form here has a margin block start of an extra rem. 1.25 even maybe. I'm just looking here like this text is, see how it's like going down a little bit to get to this side. So I want the same thing. I want to move down just a scooch uh, to go that way. And this is zoomed in a little bit more. So I think that actually looks pretty good. Um, if you haven't seen block start, this is a logical property and it's basically the same as doing your margin top. But I think it's good practice to get into using uh, logical properties because then if you want, you can do a margin block and that's going to add margin to the top and to the bottom, but nothing on the left and the right and the inline as well. And if you ever get into situations where you have languages in different uh, writing directions and other stuff, you're going to be very happy if you've normalized using logical properties. So it's a little bit longer to write uh, than margin top, but I'm going to do my block start right there. Cool. So let's get that button fixed up so we can come back up. And you'll notice the way I'm writing my CSS becomes kind of organic. People always wonder this, like when I'm building something. Uh, if this was part of a bigger project, I might just, you know, and you're working in a team or other stuff, you might be assigned just the button. And then you're only worried about the style of that button. Or maybe you're doing the whole form or something like that. And you can focus on something. I find when I'm working on something just on my own like this, I sort of go with, I try and keep my focus because if you're going all over the place, it can be problematic, but there's no harm in going, oh, I forgot to put the hover state and come back and do that. So we can come here and say uh, button hover. And that's also going to be, you might have used focus before, focus to get the focus state. I'm not going to do a focus. Uh, let's just, I'll say color is red here just to show you why. Um, if I focus on something, if I tab to it, you can see that the color has changed. If I click on it, actually, because it's a button inside the form, it's submitting the form, so it's not keeping it. But normally that would actually keep the focus state. So I actually want to do a focus visible. Uh, and a focus visible won't get, like here, I'll just do focus visible only. So if I tab onto it, it gets it. If I'm clicking, it's never getting anything. Whereas if I just said focus, when I click, I'm holding it down, you can see it's getting the red. So focus visible is a bit smarter. Uh, and it goes, I'm only going to add focus if it's keyboard navigation or if it's something like this. Uh, a focus visible on an input is going to get the focus visible because it's clear that we have focus there, even if we've clicked in it. Uh, but on buttons and stuff, focus visible is probably what you want. And it's actually the default in the browsers these days. Uh, in this case, though, we want to change my background. And I'm just going to do a linear gradient. And I think I had my two colors set up. So you can do linear gradients over multiple lines and it makes it a bit easier sometimes. So we're going to do my accent 400 comma and then my var color accent 500. And let's see what that looks like. Uh, and let's go look at the design. I don't have it opened. So we want the active states. So we can see the grid. Oh, we have a shadow. Cool. Uh, I forgot about the shadow. So that's going to be fun because I want to keep that same gradient in the shadow. The gradient sort of going left to right, I think, right? So let's just say here it's at 90 degrees. And I broke it because I forgot my comma. <laughs> there we go. Oh, I did it the wrong way. Negative 90. You can switch the color direction or you can just do a negative 90. Perfect. Their orange looks a little bit more vibrant than mine, but... Um, I, I use the right colors, so we're going to stick with that. Ooh, actually, uh, no, it won't change that. You can, yeah, we'll, we'll just stick with this. It's fine. Uh, the one issue here is if you want to transition, I can't actually transition to a linear gradient. There's no way of doing that because a linear gradient is actually a background image and background images are not animatable uh, or the, they're discrete animations. We're not going to worry about what that means. Uh, we can't transition from like the blue color to this color. Now there are ways you can figure out stuff. You can use a pseudo element and play with opacity and other stuff. We're going to sort of do that for the gradient or the shadow underneath uh, now. But um, yeah, for now, I'm just going to leave it like this. 
and hopefully you don't mind because <laughs> that's what I'm going to do. Uh, but you could take this hint. Um, so we're going to say button hover after. Uh, and then we'll do the same thing button focus visible after. And uh, sorry for the autocomplete boxes that are jumping up everywhere. Um, so yeah, we want the hover button hover after and the focus visible after. So we're adding a pseudo element once again. So we need the content and this time around the content is just going to be blank because I'm just creating a decorative element and we're going to use a position of absolute. And because it's position absolute, I'm going to come on the button here and I am going to give this a position of uh, relative. And this is important because then we want to position absolute. You might have done a top, bottom, left, right of uh, zero. If you're doing that, you can just say inset of zero. Inset is a shorthand for top, bottom, left, and right. It works the same way as margin. You can, you know, you can put four values if you want, and it's your top, your right, your bottom, and your left value. And if you omit specific values, it works exactly like the margin and padding shorthand does. So we're going to do that. And for now, let's give it a background of red so we can see it. So there we go. That's working. Uh, notice how it doesn't have a border radius on it. You could come on the parent and just do uh, the first thing some people think of in that situation is doing an overflow of hidden on the parent. But I actually need this to be down below because this is what's going to create our shadow down here. And you could just do a reddish shadow and that would be fine. But I want to show you a cool trick here. That's why we're doing it this way. Uh, so I'm just going to say the border radius is inherit. So it's whatever the border radius is of the parent. And the advantage there is if I change this border radius to, I don't know, becomes bigger, uh, let's just say two. So we get a pill shape that we're getting the same border radius no matter what. So we don't have to worry about uh, updating it in multiple places. Now, I don't actually want it to be here on top. I want it to be behind. We'll do that after. But I also need to move it down a little bit. I could play with my positioning, but I'm just going to come here and say this is a translate of zero. And that's a say 1.5 rem. Uh, and that should move it down. So there we go. We can see it's moving down. That's good. And now some of the, the trick here is I'm going to do a filter. And we're gonna do a blur of like one rem or something. And then we get a blur and you might be seeing where I'm going with this. It looks like a little bit too much. Let's take the opacity down to like 8.25 or something. So we get a softer glow coming off the bottom. So that's pretty cool, right? Now it's still on top of my text. So I am gonna give this a Z index of negative one. Uh, and then it will go behind my text, which is perfect. This, t you could get in problems with that index ease depending on the background colors and other stuff that you have going on. So the, I'll show a solution, or actually let's just, uh, let's come right here and I'll show you what could happen um, if my form has a background of purple. And we'll add padding to that just to make it more obvious, one rem. Uh, we'll see that, and let's make this white now. And we're going to turn off the blur or actually maybe we'll leave it red, but without the blur, just so we can actually see it. And it's actually going behind that background color. See that? Um, which is the problem that happens with negative Z index. So what we want is just the parent of anything that has the button on there. Uh, I can do something called isolation, isolate. And this creates a new stacking context. And if you've never heard of stacking context, uh, they're what cause a lot of stacking issues. But in this case, we actually want to cause one because now the negative one is contained within this element. So negative one is going back relative to only things inside that purple box. It can't actually go behind the purple box or in this case, our form. If we go and look at the setup here, this button is just sort of floating here. Um, so I want this Z index. We could just say every form, but you might have a button that's in a different context than a form. You, we use buttons in hero elements and like as links and in navigations and all over the place. So it depends a little bit on the setup and stuff. Now there is another solution to this than doing it with the isolation. I'm going to leave that here uh, as my solution, uh, which you might not love, but I'm going to do it that way. You could technically use has and select any parent of a button, uh, or you could actually create the gradient that's coming in there as another pseudo element. And then you're sort of we're layering everything on top of each other in the correct order. Uh, it just gets a bit more complicated. I think the, the isolation isolate works. It's a bit annoying. You have to remember where to put it. Or again, you could just say like star has uh, dot button and then that would, you know, and let's just add the background to background of purple. And actually that's a problem. We're going to do this. Um, so 
now we the isolation is working. Let's add that padding again just to show you. Um, so it is working. So I'm saying anything that has a direct child of a button is going to get the isolation on it. Uh, if you do this, you don't actually need the star. You could just do it like this. It's going to work. It's probably not the most performance selector in the world. Uh, it does serve a good purpose for a small project like this one. Again, I think just saying our form instead is fine. Uh, and then we're not worried about browser support for has or anything else, but I just want to throw out a few different options out there. But for now, I'm going to stick with this one. And what I'm actually going to do here is I'm going to switch this background now to be inherit as well, just like we did for our border radius. So it's matching and then we add our blur on there and then it gets blurry and then we can add the opacity on there. So it drops down. Maybe that's not, let's do a 0.5 maybe. So there we go. It might be a little bit too low down, but I'm going to stick with it. I think it looks pretty good. Uh, and the reason I'm doing all this, because this is a bit of overkill when we could just put an orange uh, drop shadow on there. The reason I'm doing that is let's just say here, instead of these colors, this was blue. If I did that, now my drop shadow actually matches my button. So we're inheriting that background color and then we're blurring it. So we get that same gradient going across in our drop shadow which would, we can't really do with a regular box shadow, right? So that was the reason I went to all this hard work was just to keep this very subtle gradient also in the shadow that's showing up underneath. Uh, maybe you don't think it's worth it, that's fine, but I like being able to do that. I think having gradient shadows looks pretty cool. So I'm going that route. Uh, and yeah, I'm happy with that. I'm happy with how this is looking. The next thing is the error state, and then we'll get to the desktop layout as well. And the error thing is is going to be one of my favorite things here. <laughs> and one of the reasons I even picked this, even though it's taking us a long time to get to this point. And I just want to say before we get into it that we're not doing true form validation right now. You should be doing server side form validation in one way or another. You might have a service that you're using that handles your forms. That's going to be doing the validation. That's awesome. If not, you're setting up your own form validation. If you're handling the form submission stuff yourself, make sure you have server side form validation. However, we can do a lot of the hinting and other stuff without that. And, and because there are some things that are, are you know, there, if I try doing this and I hit subscribe, it's giving me an error here because I said this isn't type email. If you remember when I set this up, uh, input type is email. So if I don't put an email address here, it notices it. Now the problem is if I do this, it would actually submit that. <laughs> it just needs the at symbol. but. Uh, you don't need like a .com or anything else like that, but at least, you know, we're, we're getting to the correct, you know, we're, we're getting somewhere, but we can improve that because the form, you know, having to rely on when you push that is kind of annoying. It would be nice if there was some sort of validation, if they did this before they do anything else. And that would, this is where, again, we're doing it pre server side validation. They, they're filling out the form. We want to give them an error if they've made a mistake before they even hit that submit button. And that's what we can do now without any JavaScript, which is cool. So uh, we're going to come back to our CSS and we're going to go to actually. So here where I have my form group, I'm actually going to add another element. And that means we are going to have to change things up a little bit. So let's just close this and close this for a second. Uh, actually, before we do that, let's go look at the error state just so we know what I'm building. You can see it says valid email required and we're changing the color of everything. That's what we're gonna be aiming for. So here in this, I'm gonna have my form group. We're gonna have a label. We're gonna have an input and then we're gonna do a span of dot error. And that was email address required. Now I'm doing it like this. Uh, with an error because I know this is the, the error for this one and there's no other things on here. Now, the problem is this breaks my layout a little bit and I am gonna need grid for this. So I'm actually gonna have my form group and I'm gonna come here and say with error uh, or with error field, uh, field, let's say. Uh, yeah, something like that. We, we just want to have this as a modifier. If you're doing this with BEM, once again, I will say you could do a form group hyphen hyphen with uh, error field, just because we have our form group and then this is the modifier for it. I'm just gonna go with my with error field. Uh, and the reason for that is, let's jump back to my styles here and let's go find that form group. And then we can say that my form group dot with error field. Once again, we are raising the specificity because we have two classes now. Some people don't like that. I think it's completely fine in this situation. 
Uh, so I'm, I'm okay with it. Uh, so form group with error field, and then we're gonna say that this is going to, we already have a display of grid on the form group. So here I can just say this is grid template columns, and on the grid template columns, let's just say that it's gonna be two columns. And then we can select this same thing here. And we're gonna say that our input that's inside of there is going to be a grid column of one over negative one, which if you're not used to grid, it's a saying we're going from the very beginning all the way to the negative end. We're doing the grid line numbers and grid line numbers start negative and count negative one way and they start positive on the other way. I'm mixing them up with my hands because whatever, doesn't matter. Uh, it means it goes all the way across if you do one to negative one. <laughs> Uh, and the last thing is on this email address required, that would be my, if we go and take a look, I called that my span of error. I am gonna keep this all within my form group just cause you might have an error somewhere else. So I do wanna scope this a little bit. So we can say form group error, uh, and that's just gonna be a text align end. And this is also a logical property. Instead of write, we can say end, and it goes to the end. Uh, and again, if this is, would change writing modes to a right to left language, then it would switch things around. So we get that set up. I think that looks pretty good. And the other thing we're gonna say here now is display of none. We don't want it to be there. There's no error right now. It's gone, uh, right? Or actually, before we do that, <laughs> one thing we'll do is uh, we want the color. Color is my var color accent, right? There we go, just so we can see it. And now I can do a display of none because we don't, we want it to be vamos. We want it out of there because we only want that to show up if somebody types something and then there's an error there. So we're gonna come back on how I can actually make that re, re appear <laughs> in a second. But what we're gonna do next is we're gonna come to where we had our inputs uh, right here. And I'm gonna say, if we have an input that's invalid we're gonna say the background is going to become, uh, ooh, we don't have that color set up, right? That's gonna, we're okay, we'll just, let's just say uh, orange for now. We'll fix that color. Uh, so if we don't have anything in here, it's normal. If I come in with an invalid thing, it's gonna change that. So in this case, the border was uh, one pixel solid, and it would be the var color accent the color of the text as well was changing over to that. So we can just copy paste. I like having text properties before border stuff. Um, and actually with that, we can take that off. So you can see if the user comes in, it's not, they haven't typed anything, so it's fine. If it's invalid, meaning we haven't, we don't have the at stuff coming in, it's going to show that we're invalid. And then as soon as we, you know, get, a, a valid email address, it's switching over. Now we don't actually, you know, if somebody, I start writing my email address, I don't want it to be saying that it's invalid at this point. I only want it to tell me that I made a mistake if I leave that field. If in the middle of writing it, it's really awkward. If And I've seen this as I'm putting in, like it, it can be useful in password fields sometimes, or it's like enter a password. Even that, I don't really like it, but it could be like, you know, just saying there's not enough characters or something could be kind of useful. But again, usually you want to tell the user, not when they've clicked this, you want to tell them before that, but you want to tell them while they're still writing it. So here, what we could actually say is not uh, focus invalid. So if we say not focus invalid, when I click in here, we're focused. So it, it's not gonna give me any errors, it's fine. So I can come in, you know, my, we can do hi at kevinpowell.co and then everything is fine. But let's say I made a mistake. I'm typing way too fast. I'm not looking what I'm doing and I do it like that. And then I push tab. Well, now this is actually getting highlighted because it's not focused and it's invalid. So we're meeting both of those states and it's going, hey, wait a second, uh, we have a problem here. So that's perfect, right? Before I click anything, before I click on my, my field, uh, I already have the error coming up. Now I also want that invalid email to show up over here. I'm actually gonna select this. Uh, and we're gonna say, this is, I'm, I am gonna use a has selector here. So I'm gonna select this part of it, I think is what we want. Uh, and I'm gonna come down to my form group with the error here. And what we're going to do is we're gonna say, so we can do the same thing, form group error. 
Uh, but we want to only select that if, uh, or even, well, let's just say, we'll come here and we'll just do display of block. I only want this to get the display of block if the form group, because we're, we're still looking at the, the entire thing here, right? So if the form group itself, if this input has is invalid. So to do that, we're gonna say has, and once again, browser support, it's not 100% here, but it's not bad. So we're gonna say has not focus and invalid. And then we're gonna add the invalid there. So let's hit save, uh, we, we are invalid. So there we go, we can see that uh, the not focus invalid, so we don't have any error. If I come in here and I start writing hi at kevinpowell.co, hit tab, nothing wrong. I forgot my at, I leave, email address is required. Because the form group has something that's not focused and which is invalid, so the error is now getting the display block on it. And as long as you only have one error per form group, uh, right, I have the, it's looking at this form group. So if I had multiple form groups here with different types of errors, right, that was, uh, you, this one's the name, uh, name, whatever, this, let's just put name here for fun. So I have multiple ones. So if I do something invalid there, it's only showing it to that one because it's only looking at that form group and then it's only getting the error for that one. And we do the same thing on this one, new address, name address required, whatever. Um, so this would work. As I, as I said, the browser support for it's not perfect, but it's pretty good. There is an alternative here where the error could actually come after. Uh, and the advantage of that is, so you can see the email address required. And if you did it this way around, you could just, we could get it to be in the right area. So let's look at actually how we could do that. Um, I could just say here that this would be my grid row of one as well. Um, and the grid column of two. Uh, and it's still gonna look the same way. We always wanna be careful when we're changing the order of elements. If we're using grid, in this case, I think it would actually be okay to have this technically coming after uh, in our markup. So this might actually be a better way of doing it. And the advantage of doing it this way is instead of having to rely on the has to be able to do it, what we could actually say is form group not focus invalid, and then I could do a plus error. And this is gonna have perfect browser support. And the reason this has good browser support is this is an error that's coming after something that's not focused and which is invalid. So if we look here, this is not focused and it's invalid. So the element that comes directly after it is getting these styles on it. So we're making it appear. So as soon as I'm focused, I'm making the changes, everything disappears, and then I go out and it reappears right there. So yeah, two different ways that you can handle that type of situation. And uh, I wasn't planning on doing it this way, but as I was working my way through it, I wanted to show it to you. And now that I think about it, it probably makes more sense for this to come after in this because of email address, we have the input, and then we have the error potentially coming afterwards. I think that might actually be better from just the way the order here, it makes a little bit more sense um, than the error coming before the thing that you've already filled out. Um, so yeah, I think we're gonna leave it that way around. And with that in place, I think it means that it's time for us to get into wearing with the larger screen sizes, which shouldn't take too much work, but the image is the first thing we're gonna do. So let's move this over, cause we're gonna want some more room just to see uh, how this is gonna work. And then we can play with our layout and, and things along the way. Uh, and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna come over here. We have our picture. And remember I said we want a picture element here and it's because we have two different images depending on what screen size we're at. So here I'm actually gonna come in with a source element. And the source element takes a couple of different attributes that we're gonna want. So the first one is actually going to be a media attribute. So we can say media is equal to, and then inside of quotation marks, and I've forgotten these in the past, I've done it like this, make sure you have your quotation marks you put in a media query. So I'm gonna say min width is 650 pixels. Uh, and then this number is just whatever works for you at your media breakpoint. Uh, and then I'm gonna write source set. So SRC set is equal to, and in this case, it's gonna be the same as this one, but it's going to be our desktop version of our image. So you just put the source set you want at that breakpoint I'm gonna hit save and look at that. We have the bigger one coming in and as that space gets smaller, it's gonna switch over. So a cool way to switch the image that you're using instead of having it to be a background image or something like that. 
Uh, and there's a lot more you can do with the picture element. I'm going to put a card popping up, up above and I'll also put a link in the description uh, to a series I did and one of them was a deep dive into the picture element because as I said, there's more to it than just what I've covered here, but at the basic level and what we need for this project, this is perfect. Now, the next thing we need to do is update the layout. So let's open up the side panel here just because I want to look at the desktop design. We have two columns, the image is on the right. We have a background color and everything is centered too, which presents, we have to make a, a bit of a change here, I guess. Two columns, okay, so let's come and we'll start here on the body. And I'm gonna do a min height here of 100 VH. And that's gonna let me do a display of grid and then a place content of center. And so with these three lines in place, if I hit save, you can see a little bit has changed. Uh, and then we want that background color, right? Background color is going to be this one, our dark one that we have. And then oh, now we can't see anything because we never set a color on the newsletter CTA. So let's go find that. We can finally use this selector right here. Background color is my var uh, color neutral 100. Perfect. I think it's gonna look a little bit strange like around here. So the image we want centered. So to do that, what we can do is let's come here and say newsletter CTA IMG can be a margin inline of auto. So margin inline is one of those logical properties I talked about. We talked about block before, which is the top and bottom because it's our block axis. Inline is our left to right. So it's our inline axis. And so we're only setting the auto on the left and the right. So it centers our image right there. Uh, this could probably be our picture element as well. Picture. Uh, oh, it can't be. Oh, that's interesting. Okay. Maybe because I think it might not be able to be the picture because that's not display block or it's already full width. Um, but the, the image is inside the picture element. So we center it right there. It's a little bit better. <laughs> it's still kind of weird. You think, I think what I'm going to do here actually is also give this a border radius of like one rem, um, just so it looks a little bit better as we transition. And especially cause we didn't have like an in-between state. I don't know what it should look like. Uh, and then if we're at smaller sizes, it still gets that squared off top. We could also change like those body styles. So it, you know, fills up the screen or whatever, but I think I'm just going to live with it like that. Uh, of course here it looks awkward, but now we're going to want the two columns anyway. So that's fine. I want it in the right place. So let's come in with a media query at media min width of 650. So I'm using the same breakpoint as the image. I don't know if it's the right number. I'm just eyeballing it. Um, there's no like specific breakpoints to use. It really depends on the layout that you're doing. Uh, and then we want to come in with this and let's do a grid template columns of, let's just make it two columns. Uh, of course, it's not working because we don't have a display of grid on there, which would help. Perfect. There we go. Uh, so that's okay. It's kind of weird though, right? <laughs> let's come on. Let's say this has a max width of 800 pixels or so. That looks a bit better. It's kind of weird still, but we'll, we'll get there. We'll get there. Um, I think we actually want it to get a bit bigger than that. Let's say 850 and let's just shrink this down. So we have a bit more space to play with. That looks like it's okay at the 850. Um, what's weird is when we're getting to here, the way the, the image is doing its thing, actually the image should be on the other side anyway. So let's fix that. So when we get to here, we're going to do the newsletter CTA. We want the content. So dot content is going to be, uh, and this is a direct child, so we might as well select it that way. Uh, this would be a grid column, column of one and the grid row of one. I'm doing both just to make sure. I think without this, yeah, it gets pushed down. So it's going, well, my image is first. I want to be in the same row, so it's uh, the same column. So I'm going to go underneath it by saying grid row and grid column of one. We're sort of forcing it into place. We always want to be careful when we're changing the order of things, whether it's using Flexbox or using grid, but because this is just a decorative image, moving the image around isn't really changing anything. And all of this content is staying in the same place. Um, I think what I'm also going to do here, see how like the image, the, the column that the image is in is getting too big. So I think I'm actually going to do this as a max content. So 
that means the this column is always going to match the size of the image and the see like the image isn't actually changing size uh, it's the other column that's changing size and I might change that breakpoint it's getting a bit narrow there actually I'll be honest I'm not in love with how that's working because it's getting kind of awkward there uh, one okay a couple things I'm gonna come here I'm gonna give this a margin inline of like one rem just so it never touches the edge of the page because it was kind of weird so we're keeping just a little bit of spacing there um i think i want that image to shrink because it's kind of weird how everything else is getting squished and here everything is getting a little bit spaced out so we already have a display of grid coming on here so i'm going to add in uh, an align items of center just so it's going to center that. So if I turn that off, if you look here, everything's like spaced out more because that entire piece is spaced out uh, and it's that's using grid. So the cells sort of spread out along it. So if I say center, it means it's going to stay centered. And then as this shrinks, the image will stay sh centered, which is probably better, but I don't like the image at max content anymore. Um, I thought that would be, maybe even the image could be like a little bit smaller. So we could do something like that. So this area gets more space compared to that one, but then they're both gonna sort of shrink um, and do their own thing. Maybe that's a little bit of a better option uh, along the way there. I'm, I think that looks pretty good. So I'm gonna leave it like that. Maybe I'm wrong, but I'm gonna argue that this might actually be taking up more room than there. Um, so you know what, I'm pretty happy with that. I think there's a few small things. I think the font size at larger screen sizes is actually bigger. Uh, of course, if you're following along, there's when you click this, where does it go? What happens? There is a success screen uh, that you can build in, but we covered a lot in this video. It ended up being a lot longer than I planned from the beginning anyway, and I'm pretty happy with how it looks now that we've got to this point. So as I mentioned, I, I said a lot of videos along the way, so I've linked them all in the description, and they're also all in a playlist that you can see right here if you'd like to find any of them very quickly. They're all uh, in that playlist that's there for your viewing pleasure. And with that, I would like to thank my enablers of awesome, Andrew, Philip, Simon, and Tim, as well as all my other patrons for their monthly support. And of course, until next time, don't forget to make your corner of the internet just a little bit more Awesome.